What's going on ladies and gents, boys and girls, gamers of all ages, Joker back again, once again. And this, this is going to be a hard one. Halo Infinite is not that great of a game. At least as far as the single player goes, though the multiplayer does have a lot of room to improve as well, and no amount of copium is going to change that. So let's rip the bandaid off and get right into it. That's beautiful, isn't it? To some. First things first, the positives. Hmm, I guess that's not ripping the band-aid off. Eh, whatever. So knowing that I would be reviewing Halo Infinite after everybody and their mother reviewed it due to a lack of an advanced copy, I had to come at Halo Infinite with a different angle. So I decided to play it on Xbox One. Now, there's a few reasons for this. Most reviews are going to be reviewing it on a Series S or X or a high-end PC. However, I don't know if you've noticed, but Series S's and X's are kind of hard to get right now. But I'm pretty sure most people who want to play Halo Infinite have an Xbox One. So I decided to dust off the old Xbox One, load up Halo Infinite, and prepare for a shit show. And to be honest, I thought this was going to be another Cyberpunk 2077 in terms of graphics and performance. But I was pleasantly surprised. Well, of course, Halo Infinite was going to be a downgrade on older hardware, especially with graphics, more so when it came to things like faces and hair. I found that between a mix of optimization and just clever artistic design, while jarring in some places, wasn't the game-breaking eye-bleeding nightmare I expected it to be. And it's pretty easy to see. Scenes like this are bad. Scenes like this, where it's mostly art direction and armor design, are not. And if this is the worst that your game has to offer, graphically speaking, on 13-year-old hardware, you could do worse. So again, I have to applaud 343 for their amazing art direction. If it wasn't for this art direction, if Halo didn't look as unique as it does, it would probably be a much uglier game. The other brilliant thing about Halo Infinite, at least on the Xbox One, is how it played. In my 20 hours of gameplay, I ran into maybe one stutter and a singular crash, but given that Halo Infinite seems to crash no matter what hardware you're playing on, I'm inclined to believe that it had less to do with the hardware and more to do with Halo Infinite. The load times for Halo Infinite are not egregious by any stretch of the imagination past the initial loading into the game, which can take forever but once you're in the game, it actually runs a lot better than expected. I was fully expecting to be traversing across the land and grapple hook a mountain and that mountain just so happens to be on a loading zone and then hit the loading zone and freeze for like five seconds or hit a loading zone as I'm flying a plane across the map. Nope, none of that. I have to admit, I'm honestly impressed with what 343 did with Halo Infinite running on old tech. Now, don't get me wrong, you're probably going to have a much better experience playing it on a high-end PC or an Xbox S or an Xbox X. But if you don't have access to those and you want to play Halo Infinite, you could do worse and your grievances with Halo Infinite likely aren't going to come from performance. Nor will they come from gameplay. Halo Infinite's gameplay is unapologetically Halo at its core. Halo's bread and butter is really how satisfying the combat gameplay loop is and how the game encourages you to use your upgrades, swap weapons, scavenge weapons, try something new. Halo Infinite, gameplay-wise, is a great sandbox game. However, with Halo Infinite, 343 decided to try something new, add an open world. And while open world levels have been tried in Halo before, in my humble opinion, it doesn't work here. In fact, it detracts from the game and the sandbox and everything that makes Halo single players, Halo single players. The open world for Halo Infinite is hollow, it's barren. It's divided into sections. Each section has a few Marines to go save, a couple of bases to win back, a high value target to kill, it's all so very formulaic. It's like 343 is trying to do their best impersonation of an Ubisoft game. In fact, if somebody told me that this was a parody of an Ubisoft game, I'd believe them. There's really no point to doing these activities other than the ability to find Spartan cores and spawn in better weapons and vehicles at your forward operating bases. But that's also kind of the problem. When I can spawn in a Scorpion, that level where I get a Scorpion isn't as special. In fact, there's no level where you actually just get a scorpion. You can find some out in the open world, but there's no level specifically designed with a scorpion in mind. And that is the greatest travesty of this open world. Halo is kind of known for its gimmick levels. Your Warthog run levels, your tank levels, your sniper stealth levels. One of the most iconic missions in all of Halo is in Halo Reach, when you go into space and have a dogfight over Reach. 
Halo Infinite sacrifices these really cool classic set piece moments for an open world, one that really doesn't add anything to the game. And it's odd because it's not like this is the first Halo to experiment with an open world, at least of sorts. Halo ODST had an open world hub. In Halo ODST, you would go from location to location, reliving the journey of the rest of your ODST squad mates. You get your stealth missions, you get your vehicle missions, and you get your open world. Halo ODST should have been the blueprint for Halo Infinite. Instead, what we got was an open world that does relatively nothing for the game, except for maybe pad out playtime. Halo Infinite really misses those wow moments that make Halo special. The open world is just a bunch of loosely tied together dots on a map where you go from place to place, you kill a couple things, you press a button, you get a cinematic. Which segues us nicely to quite possibly the worst part of Halo Infinite, the story. Our story will outlive us both. If you're going to talk about the story of Halo Infinite, you're going to inevitably have to talk about the characters and the ending. So let's just um get it over with. First, you have the pilot, who's running for the modern interpretation of Navi. Instead of, hey, listen, hey, listen, hey. Listen! Every five seconds, it's... We're gonna die! We're gonna die! We're gonna die! Chief, we're gonna die! <laughs> Crushed! Broken! Beaten! Useless! Oh, for God's sake, pull yourself together, man. While being fully aware that if we don't stop the Banish, they're going to get a hold of a weapon that can wipe out all life in the galaxy. Look, I get that the pilot's not military. I get that he's a civilian contract volunteer engineer. At the same time, you're on humanity's flagship during a time of war. What did you think would happen? And even if you wanted to say for the sake of argument that the pilot's reaction to everything going on is normal, what does having some dude running around every five minutes whinging about having to help the Master Chief, the savior of humanity, once again save the universe from aliens that want to destroy it, or whatever, add to the game? In cinematics, sure. In fact, I would argue that the actor does a fantastic job with what he's given, portraying this believable coward. But at the same time, I'm Master fucking Chief. I've saved humanity countless times. So this guy's incessant whining isn't endearing. It doesn't make me care about the character. It's almost like 343 went out of their way to make the pilot the anti-Johnson, the anti-hype man, the anti-this. Where's the rest of your platoon? Wasted, Sarge. And we will be too, sir, if we don't get the hell out of here. You hit Marine. <laughs> no, sir. Then listen up. Usually the good Lord works in mysterious ways, but not today. This here is 66 tons of straight up H.E. spewing divine intervention. If God is love, then you can call me Cupid. What about that scare? We've all run the simulations. They're tough, but they ain't invincible. Stay with the Master Chief. He'll know what to do. Yes, sir, Sergeant. Thanks for the tank. He never gets me anything. Oh, I know what the ladies like. I also don't think it helps that there's like this weird narrative off switch for the pilot. There's no character progression. One minute he's bitching about how we're all going to die and how he wants to get back to his family, which may actually be dead. Yeah, that's kind of glossed over. And then he has this touchy feely emotional breakdown with the Master Chief and suddenly he's ready to take on the Banished. There's no character growth here. There's no coming to an understanding of, I need to do what needs to be done and I need to get over my fears. There's no sudden realization of what it means if the Banished get a hold of Halo. And I think that's largely because we don't know what it means if the Banished get a hold of Halo. We don't know what it means if the Banished get a hold of the Endless. We don't know anything. Stop asking questions. The pilot's character development is more like character whiplash and represents one of the biggest narrative issues within Halo Infinite. The fact that there's so much crammed in this story, two games worth of narrative, that everything gets boiled down to a bullet point before moving on to the next thing. They'll pair you with another AI. Maybe even another Cortana model if Halsey lets them. That's not going to happen. It won't be me. You know that, right? On successful deployment, my deletion routine was supposed to complete. Still here. <laughs> Good. Good? Something stopped your deletion. We need to find out why. But 
This wasn't the mission. The missions change. They always do. Are you sure? the weapon, a.k.a. not Cortana, a.k.a. probably Cortana. And what about you? What about me? What do I call you? Any ideas? Well, do you think it would be okay? You're sure? You get to choose your name. Then I think, I think I might have the perfect one. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Get ready. The relationship between John and probably Cortana, I mean the weapon, should have been the emotional core of Halo Infinite, because it's the inevitable outcome of Halo 4's story. And while there's a lot of time spent on the relationship between John and Cortana and Cortana 2 Electra Boogaloo, most of it is a retread of Halo 4, saying goodbye to Cortana again. But more on that later. Cortana 2 Electra Boogaloo is the new plucky sidekick. Largely, she's fine. She's a younger, more naive iteration of Cortana, coming off more as a teenage daughter figure than the partner that Cortana was. You of course can't talk about not Cortana without talking about Cortana, who totally isn't recompiling bits of herself inside the new Cortana after killing herself for some reason to stop Atriox, which she totally did. Criterion has given the order. Offensive bias has been deployed. Stop! Don't ask questions! Not Cortana, of course, upon finding out that she's basically Cortana 2.0, has a little bit of a mental breakdown. You know, as you do. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. That wasn't me. It can't be. I shouldn't be here. Your mission was to destroy me. But the plot must move on, and speaking of Cortana, after her death in Halo 4, she was brought back to the power of retcon and deus ex machina. I mean, the forerunner domain that she somehow found herself in. Don't ask questions! She then decides that she needs to become the space pope or the grand pooba of existence because fleshy meatbags keep trying to kill one another and she wants to create a world where there will be no envy, no suffering, no starvation, etc, 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 and we're never really told how this is bad. I mean, don't get me wrong, in Halo Infinite, we're shown a couple of examples of uh, how this is bad, because uh, she goes a little overboard when it comes to the use of force to enforce her laws. Atriox, leader of the banished, how do you stand? With the banished, always, forever. And you understand the consequences of defiance. I do. Do you? The intricacies of any action are complex. The reactions numerous, yet mostly predictable. Look upon Doisek one last time, and remember, you chose this path. Arbiter killed a billion people and everybody loves him. And he was doing it because he was lied to and was on his way to genocide all existence. Cortana just wanted people to, um, keep the peace? 
which is bad because... Don't ask questions! This new world that Cortana wants to bring into existence, of course, brings her into conflict with Oni and the UNSC. This is not a negotiation, Lord. This is your surrender. My terms are clear. You are aware of my capabilities, and I am fully acquainted with yours. If the Earth's government wants to fight, feel free. But hear this. It is a battle you will not win. Cortana, over UNSC, AI Leonidas stands with you. How should I proceed? Population? Baconia Station currently holds 76 Spartan Fours. They have orders to stand against you. Short-sighted fools. You have served me well, Leonidas. Your sacrifice is appreciated. Understood. Goodbye. Good time. No! And she's of course brought into conflict with the Atriox and Banished, whose homeworld she destroys. Yeah, this is where the plot gets pretty dumb, so let me get this straight. Cortana has the Guardian, these Guardians that can destroy planets. She has the Halos, and God knows what other Forerunner technology at her disposal. She has an army of created at her beck and call, but Atriox just comes out of nowhere and not only gets the upper hand on Cortana, but beats her? How? Don't ask questions. Atriox then takes control of Zeta Halo. How? Don't ask questions. Where's Cortana's army of created and guardians and other forerunner stuff? Don't ask questions. Why does Cortana have to kill herself to blow up Zeta Halo when she's part of the domain. Don't ask questions! Why did 343 kill Cortana in Halo 4 only to bring her back in Halo 5 as this apparent evil emperor force whose plans are evil for the sake of being evil because the writers have told us that they're evil only to then finish Cortana's character assassination in Halo Infinite but in the same breath try to read Redeem her by playing off the great character work and nostalgia of the Halo 4 ending, thus further diminishing the ending of that game, all while introducing Cortana 2, who by the end of the game is Cortana, not Cortana, she names herself Cortana, maybe. Don't ask questions! If you think this is bad, somehow it gets worse. So all of this narrative stuff, Cortana destroying Australia, Cortana destroying the Spartan 4 training facility, Cortana destroying the brute homeworld, the creation of Cortana 2, the finding of Cortana and Zeta Halo, all basically happen off screen. We're shown it in flashbacks, but things like the start of Halo Infinite feels like the cliffhanger to a Halo 6 that was never made. My name is Atriox, and I and the last face you will ever see. Like, it's really easy to imagine Halo 6 ending like that, and then the legendary ending being the pilot finding Master Chief. In contrast, what did we get with Halo Infinite's story? Well, something fairly bog standard. Stop the Banished from taking over Halo! Because that's bad! However, the Banished are not alone, for you see, they have the aid of an ancient evil that was buried away from time and memory for an eternity within the depths of a Forerunner installation. The Gravemind. Wait, no. The Precursors. Wait, no. The Didact. Wait, no. We've already done all of that. Hmm. Time for 343 to pull something entirely new out of their ass. But it has to have a punchy title that goes great after the word THE. Ah, yes. The Harbinger. Who's the Harbinger? What are the Endless? I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. Well, at the very least, we have some idea as to why they were imprisoned on Halo because apparently they're more dangerous than the Flood? One single Flood Spore can destroy a species. Oh, we never see this or have it explained to us, but I mean an ounce of dialogue tells us it's true, so it must be. The closest thing that we get to an explanation as to why the Endless are bad is because the Forerunners, after destroying all sentient life in the galaxy, stumbled upon them 
got really freaked out that they weren't destroyed by the Halos and imprisoned them for it. The Harbinger, who is now the big bad ancient evil, apparently, is mildly upset with her entire civilization being locked away and wants to free her people. And somehow they're the bad guy? I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. Hell, the legendary ending outright tells us that the Endless thought the Forerunners were there to help them, and then imprison them because they survived the firing of the Halos. And freeing the Endless is a bad thing because... Hands. Are we the baddies? Yeah, this is dumb. When you power scale against the Flood, one single flood spore can destroy a species. You kind of have to earn that. And 343 has shown us nothing that indicates that the Endless are a threat or anything more than the victims of the Forerunners. Hell, during the Harbinger's boss fight, the most deadly thing in the room was a brute with a hammer. The Endless continue this trend with 343 villains where not only do they have to add a new world ending villain every game, but that world ending villain tends to be poorly defined within that game. The Banished being against humanity, I get. Cortana was created by humanity and she destroyed the Brute's homeworld. However, the Endless, much like Cortana in Halo 5 and the Didact in Halo 4 if you didn't read the Forerunner novels, are poorly fleshed out and poorly defined. Halo Infinite's narrative suffers from trying to do too much at once. It has to finish Halo 4 and 5's story, it has to bring in and introduce the Banished to anyone who didn't play Halo Wars 2, it has to give the Banished a motivation to be against humanity, all while setting up for the future of Halo. And it does so, as I stated earlier, by relegating all of that stuff to flashbacks. Making Halo Infinite feel like the boring cleanup side story to a vastly more interesting game that we'll never get to play. Halo Infinite marks the start of the next 10 years of Halo. However, as a send-off to that old world and that old lore, Halo Infinite really does the people who like that narrative a disservice, because it doesn't wrap that old world up in any satisfying way. It sprints to the end, and says in no uncertain terms that that old status quo is gone and that this is going to be the new status quo going forward. However, the resolution of Cortana's story should have been a game in its own right. Instead, what we get with Halo Infinite is a narrative that often feels like a bunch of bullet points for a game that we never played and doesn't exist, all while trying to set up the future of Halo without demonstrating why we should even care. Halo Infinite is supposed to be a live service game with a 10 year plan. However, with Halo Infinite, what 343 has demonstrated is not the ability to iterate on something until it works, but the propensity to just throw it away if it doesn't work on its first outing. What happens when Halo Infinite's player base falls off in a year or two? Does Halo become another anthem? Does 343, just like with Spartan Ops or the created story, like so many other things that they've created over the last decade, throw it out the window? It wasn't Spartan Ops that was bad. It wasn't enhanced mobility that was terrible. It wasn't the created storyline that failed. It was the execution of these ideas. Any of these ideas, all of them, could have been really great if executed properly, but they weren't. They were squandered, and once squandered, thrown out the window. Will 343 learn from their past? Or will they keep making the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over again? Failing, then starting from scratch, then failing again without learning anything from their past. I don't know. And that's the depressing thing with Halo Infinite, with 343's propensity to just throw things that don't work out the window, instead of iterating on them and learning from the past, the future of the Halo franchise is always in flux. Will 343 be able to pull off what, really, only Bungie has done with Destiny, with Halo? Will 343 be able to take a game that launched in a rough spot, barren of features with a meh story, and keep it going for years and years and years as they've said they plan to? Or will Halo Infinite be another anthem? Just another cautionary tale in a long line of live service games that die. Only time will tell. And while I do have more thoughts on Halo, I think this is a good spot to end the video on. So let me know what you thought in the comments below. Remember to like, but only if you did. Subscribe for more. Feel free to donate to my Patreon if you're feeling particularly generous. But above all else, stay frosty.